Ohio, Hopkins, Webster, Harlan, and Breathitt counties some access to the road. The Fleming Neon Project in Letcher County is building uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Andy, and welcome to today's Team Kentucky Update. We've got a lot of good news today, and we'll start with some good news about good work that we've been doing over the past year, restoring historic mine lands and providing safe and reliable drinking water to our Eastern Kentucky families. Last June, we announced that Kentucky was being awarded more than $74 million through the bipartisan infrastructure law to clean up hazards left by historic mining. These funds are helping us close dangerous mine shafts, reclaim unstable slopes, and improve water quality for our communities and our families. Since the funds were announced, the Energy and Environment Cabinet's Division of Abandoned Mine Lands has completed or started work on 38 projects across 15 counties, totaling almost $45 million. We've been able to give families in Floyd, Whitley, Perry, Pike, Knott, Letcher, Bell, Leslie, Johnson, Boyd, Ohio, Hopkins, Webster, Harlan and Breathitt counties, some peace of mind that their homes won't be threatened or that their roads won't be washed out. Just some of the projects include the NASCAR Lane project in Perry County uh, is restoring a hillside after a landslide threatened a home and blocked access to the road. The Fleming Neon project in Letcher County is building retaining walls to stabilize the hillside above Fleming Neon City Park to ensure safe access to the nearby uh, Adbu Street. The Bobby Reed Drainage Reclamation Project in Johnson County is protecting a 12 home subdivision by building concrete ditches, culverts, and drop boxes to control drainage. The funding is also being used to rebuild water and wastewater infrastructure. It includes replacing a water line in the city of Hazard to bring reliable drinking water to 150 homes, updating and repairing water line infrastructure to make sure that 2,500 homes along Kentucky Highway 80 East between the communities of Ambergy and Montgomery Creek Road have access to safe, reliable drinking water and repairing damaged water and wastewater lines in Breathitt County for 961 homes. Today, we're pleased to have Deputy Secretary Laura Daniel Davis from the Department of Interior, as well as Principal Deputy Director Sharon Buccino from the Office of Surface Mining Reclamation and Enforcement. Yesterday, they both toured the Bobby Reed uh, Project in Johnson County, and they got to see firsthand uh, how these federal dollars are being used in Kentucky for such important work. And then they toured the East Kentucky Advanced Manufacturing Institute, which we call ECAMI, in Paintsville and saw what some of the Amler dollars uh, have done there. The Academy received $2.5 million in those funds to help create a training program that certifies folks in computer, robotics, and manufacturing fields. I've toured this facility uh, a number of times. I think they have a 100% or close to a 100% job uh, placement uh, rate. It's truly uh, an incredible uh, training operation. The program helps displace coal miners and others across Eastern Kentucky looking for a new future, and they've graduated more than 250 Kentuckians. I wanna thank Deputy Secretary Daniel Davis and Principal Deputy Director Buccino for their great support with these grant programs. They are making a difference in Kentucky. Now I'm in, gonna invite Acting Deputy Secretary Daniel Davis to speak as she'll be announcing some new and additional funding. Thank you so much, Governor Bashir, um, and thank you for allowing me to guest star with you here today. Um, and it's such an honor, and it's Leap Day, which is always exciting. And this morning I was told it's the meteorological last day of winter, but I will say that I feel like winter is not quite done with us yet, uh, given how it feels here. Um, I have spent, as the governor said, the last two days in the Commonwealth. Uh, yesterday I was in Paintsville and did see that project uh, that you saw a picture of as part of the Biden-Harris administration's Investing in America tour. It's so valuable to be with our colleagues from the Office of Surface Mining Reclamation and Enforcement, their new leader, Sharon Bacino, Governor, your team, uh, who 
was well represented on the ground uh, to celebrate major progress through the bipartisan infrastructure law to create jobs cleaning up these toxic sites and building healthier communities. Um, and I, I just want to say we really could not have a better partner in all this work than the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Uh, I have really appreciated the opportunity uh, to work, uh, Governor, with your terrific team, have actually spent a lot of time on these programs and are uh, excited that things are going well on the ground and to be able to see it. Of course, the Secretary was here when we announced the $74.2 million in funding from the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law uh, for the Commonwealth to create jobs and tackle these problematic sites. Um, and as the Governor said, yesterday we were able to tour that that site in Johnson County where construction work is underway. And I do mean it's underway. I know that the residents in that community are grateful for the work that is being done to remediate the, the, the water issues and the sort of open mine portals. There is a lot of heavy equipment out there and they are doing real work. It was terrific to see. Um, but, you know, dealing with the drainage issues that are associated with these old mines, dealing with a, a sort of water and drainage uh, that was really threatening these homes, the folks that live here. Um, it's going to make such a big difference uh, on a long-term basis going forward. And um, we're just grateful that we have uh, the new resources and have such great partners in the state, uh, the Commonwealth, to get the work done together. And the reality is that legacy pollution like this continues to impact really too many of our waterways and our neighborhoods. Um, and as I said, now we have the resources to together tackle these problems problems and keep communities safer. Um, President Biden's Investing in America agenda de delivers the largest investment in history to tackle legacy pollution. And that includes a total of $11.3 billion to invest in abandoned mine land remediation over the course of 15 years. Um, and with these historic resources, the Biden-Harris administration is working with you um, and many communities all across the country to create good paying jobs to make way for new economic opportunities. And we certainly saw that in Johnson County and improve the health, safety and quality of life for people in Kentucky and really across the nation. Um, so today I'm really thrilled to announce uh, the Department of the Interior is investing another $74.2 million uh, for and with the Commonwealth to create even more jobs and tackle even more of these legacy polluting sites. I know that all of you, Governor, your viewers, listeners, readers, everyone knows all too well that the effects of legacy pollution continue to be felt really acutely in this region in Appalachia. And too often, um, you know, companies have not been held accountable uh, for the legacy their activities uh, have left beyond, behind. They've they just moved on. Um, and I'm also announcing today, uh, you know, in light of the sort of regional challenge, uh, the launch of the department's new Appalachia Keystone Initiative. And this will attempt to address the critical intersection of climate change with the ecological, social, economic needs of the region. So it'll be very focused on local partnerships uh, and the Keystone Initiative will coordinate investments across the region to support communities, uh, enhance wildlife habitat, which is so important, uh, and expand outdoor recreation. As we're also continuing this work together with the resources we're announcing today to tackle legacy pollution. Um, these investments are all part of the administration's all of government approach to support communities as the energy economy continues to undergo uh, an important transition. So together, we're gonna make these smart investments. We are already making these these smart investments. We're going to build a cleaner and more just future for our children, for our grandchildren. Thank you all very much again for having me here today. Uh, and I'm going to turn it back over to the governor. Well, thank you to the deputy secretary and please thank the president and the vice president for uh, this new funding, 74 million additional dollars. Uh, put to work uh, like what you've seen today, protecting our communities. And many of these families have been worried 
about some of these conditions for years, if not longer, and they are now seeing real action because of it. Also want to thank former Congressman John Yarmouth, who helped shepherd the bipartisan infrastructure law through, and Senator Mitch McConnell, uh, who voted for it. Those were the members of our delegation that, that pushed for this transformational law that's doing everything from uh, helping these families to uh, helping us build the uh, Brent Spence Companion Bridge and to do so without tolls. This second year grant means that Team Kentucky will be able to continue its excellent record of reclaiming Kentucky's inventory of historic coal mining hazards that are impacting our coal field communities. Our Kentucky families will directly benefit from this work and it will create good jobs in Eastern Kentucky held by Eastern Kentuckians. For those contractors who want, us, who want to help us out in this important work, you can visit eec.ky.gov slash AML for more information or see the Finance Cabinet Plan Room for upcoming projects. Uh, today, we also have some great economic development news to share. Since the beginning of my administration, uh, we have been on uh, the biggest, uh, best economic development win streak we've seen in our history here in the Commonwealth. We've announced over a thousand new location and expansion projects for a record what is now $30.3 billion of new private sector investment in us while creating almost 52,000 new Kentucky jobs. We've had some great projects approved just this morning uh, by the Kentucky Economic Development Finance Authority, including our next round of approvals in our KPDI program. Remember, this is how we help sites get to the next level to be uh, build ready and not shovel ready. But first, the Finance Authority approved four new location and expansion projects uh, that'll invest another $258 million in Kentucky and create 73 good paying jobs. The projects include Niagara Bottling, uh, which is investing $114.3 million in Boone County and creating 60 jobs. Franklin Precision Industry is investing $1.66 million in Simpson County, creating 13 jobs. Blue Moon Energy is going to invest $128.8 million in Harrison County, and True Tone Finishing in Fayette County is investing $13.6 million dollars. In addition, 13 counties received KPDI funding at today's meeting. They include Clark, Clinton, Graves, Green, LaRue, Laurel, Logan, Montgomery, Nelson, Pulaski, Scott, Wayne, and Webster. The Commonwealth is providing over $15 million in state support for projects totaling nearly $35.8 million in community investment. These are funds going to grow new jobs and to continue to build these communities. This program is how we win speed to market. It's one of the most important things that we're able to tell companies that if they choose us, we will get them up and operating faster than anywhere else. That takes the infrastructure, that takes the land, that takes the rail, that takes the road, that takes all of those things that that uh, next potential industry is going to look for. It's this type of investment we are seeing emulated uh, across the country. Uh, and this keeps us on this win streak where remember in 2022, Site Selection Magazine had us for that year at number two in per capita economic development in the country. We are awaiting 2023's numbers, but I am certain that we will continue to be at the top of that list uh, leading uh, this country as a new economic powerhouse. And if that wasn't proof enough that the Commonwealth is on an economic roll, today I'm able to announce that more Kentucky-made prod products were shipped around the world in 2023 than in any other year on record. In 2023, we broke our export record and set an all-time new record here in Kentucky. That new total is... $40.2 billion in exports. And that was a 16.6% increase over 2022. Aerospace products and parts once again led Kentucky's export category with pharmaceuticals and medicines, motor vehicles, motor vehicle parts, and basic chemicals rounding out our top five. Our top export destinations have remained fairly consistent in recent years with Canada continuing to be our leading uh, export partner, followed by the United Kingdom, Mexico, France, and China. 
Thanks to 2023's record high, Kentucky made products continue to make their way into more homes and more businesses all around the world. Our commitment to global partnerships is another way that we're making sure Kentucky is the best place to do business. And remember, Kentucky's products are second to none. Which brings me to a product that yesterday I got to go celebrate uh, in an expansion. Shady Rays is a national leader in lifestyle and adventure eyewear. I've owned and lost a couple pairs of their sunglasses, but since they have a subscription service, I keep getting new pairs back. Now, I helped them open their very first storefront in Lexington, and this company has just taken off. Uh, very impressively, it's led by two brothers that are able to get along and uh, run uh, an impressive company, uh, something that Jeff and I will have to talk about maybe one day. So yesterday I was honored to join their leadership in their new corporate headquarters and fulfillment center and distribution warehouse in Simpsonville. Shady Rays is a quality company that continues to bring great opportunities for Shelby County. I'm thrilled to celebrate this exciting next step. Got to see some of their new uh, golf uh, sunglasses, which are pretty impressive. I think they're the only group that makes those specifically as well as a lot of that, those are their golf sunglasses, as well as a number of their other products. Next to our collaborative economic development blueprint. It's clear that Kentucky's future is bright and we're already looking towards the future. On Tuesday, we announced the collaborative blueprint, a plan created by and for Kentucky's economic developers. With the support of Team Kentucky, the Cabinet for Economic Development partnered with the Kentucky Association for Economic Development led this initiative. Over the past several months, we've developed this blueprint for economic developers and stakeholders to spur further growth in the Commonwealth over the next five years. The blueprint can be found at ced.ky.gov slash LP slash blueprint. Before we move on, I want to talk about where I'm headed at exactly 1 p.m. today, another uh, great announcement. Uh, later this afternoon, I'll be in Louisville with Mayor Greenberg and the leadership of MMY US. MMY is a United Kingdom-based manufacturer of modular housing units. They're locating their very first US facility in West Louisville. This is a $6.1 million investment that's gonna create 73 full-time jobs with an average wage of $30 per hour and a minimum of $23 an hour. Both of those are before benefits. This is a really exciting project. And, and if you look at Stellar Snacks, which we had previously announced, this is continuing a trend of more jobs coming to West Louisville, which hasn't seen enough jobs in a long time. It also extends our reputation as a center for advanced manufacturing and ultimately, um, helping to address the, the nationwide crisis in affordable housing, which is the product that this group uh, presents. Uh, I look forward to celebrating this great project for uh, what it means for the people of Kentucky, but especially what it means for Louisville and for West Louisville. Now, today we also have your Lieutenant Governor with us to provide a couple of updates. And I get to congratulate her today on being famous. Today, she was named one of USA Today's Women of the Year honorees. She's the honoree for Kentucky, and I couldn't think of anyone more uh, deserving. So we're going to hear from the Lieutenant uh, Governor. Um, again, congratulations. And after her, we're going to hear from Dr. Stack on measles. Yeah, thank you, Governor. Um, so today, my first... Uh, update is going to be about the Kentucky Main Street 2023 report. Kentucky's main streets are the backbone of our communities and the heart of our small towns. Attracting people, businesses, and opportunities, our downtowns help provide prosperity for Kentuckians in every corner of the Commonwealth. And this year, the Kentucky Main Street program celebrates its 45th anniversary, and it's a great time for us to reflect on the impact that this program has made in small towns across Kentucky. The Kentucky Main Street Program, which is a part of the Kentucky Heritage Council, exists to support communities through economic investment, historic preservation, and the re redevelopment of communities. As someone from rural Kentucky, investing in rural communities is something that has been a top priority for our administration. 
I think why I understand why Team Kentucky must be committed to ensuring economic growth is touching every community in this Commonwealth. And this important program has helped create significant growth for our main streets. Today, we celebrate the success of the 24 participating communities that support Kentucky's economic economy and our $12.9 billion tourism industry. In 2023, Kentucky Main Street communities reported $61.4 million in investment in downtown commercial districts. This total represents $5.6 million in budget and grant contributions from counties and cities and $23.1 million in private investments, matched by $32.7 million in public improvements that include building rehabilitation and renovations, new construction, and other enhancement projects. These communities also finished the year with a net gain of 649 new jobs and 126 new businesses. Additionally, the communities reported 30 new business expansions, 223 rehabilitation projects, 214 facade and exterior renovation projects, 190 improvement projects, and 10 new construction projects completed in Main Street districts. We thank all the Main Street directors, local restaurants, and businesses for their continued effort to strengthen our downtowns, especially during the 45th anniversary year. Your success is not only creating strong communities for the future, but it's also guaranteeing that communities throughout the Commonwealth have the necessary resources to attract new businesses, guests, and jobs, which turn, helps us turn and turn into a thriving community. To learn more about the Kentucky Main Street Program, please visit heritage.ky.gov. All right, next up, I'm really excited to be able to make an announcement about the Kentucky Commission on Women. Um, as the highest elected woman in this state, I often think about the kind of world I want to leave for my two daughters, Emma and Evelyn. And I believe it's my duty to elevate the voices of women to validate the struggles that we face and to work hard to find viable solutions to those challenges. And that is the work of the Kentucky Commission on Women. The members of the Commission on Women are a diverse set of women from all walks of life and all geographic areas of Kentucky. They are tasked with improving the status of women in Kentucky, educating the public about issues and, challenging, uh, and challenges pertaining to women and bringing policymakers and advocates together. I believe that women sit at an intersection of difficulty and opportunity, and it's true that we've come a long way, just like it's also true that we still have a long way to go. Kentucky women have long faced immense barriers to fair treatment in the workforce. These are the very obstacles our leaders and society have failed to address for generations, and they hide in plain sight. In Kentucky, we make 79 cents for every dollar a man makes, and for women of color, it is even less. And in Kentucky, women are tasked with the responsibility of raising children in a state that has failed to fund preschool or other equitable access to early child care. So tomorrow, March 1st, we are going to kick off Women's History Month in Kentucky. Women's History Month is a celebration of women's contributions to history, culture, and society. And the month of March evolved as Women's History Month for International Women's Day, which had previously been established as March 8th. Following a decade of work by the National Women's History Project, Congress designated March as Women's History Month in 1987. In Kentucky, we have been blessed with women leaders who blaze the trail for people just like me to follow. Women like Nettie Depp, Senator Georgia Davis Powers, and of course, Governor Martha Lane Collins. This year, Women's History Month in Kentucky is going to be even more special because on March 22nd, we are unveiling the portraits for the seven new inductees to the Kentucky Women Remembered Exhibit right here in the Capitol. These are the first inductees in about five years. And so, Governor, I want to thank you for helping us to elevate women in Kentucky. These incredible honorees have created a legacy that deserves celebrating. And this event is open to the public, so I hope that you will plan to join us. And finally, I'm proud to announce that the Kentucky Commission on Women is now active on social media. I encourage you to follow the commission on Facebook and on Instagram, and we will use this space to continue to educate Kentuckians on women's contributions to our society, 
share relevant data, and introduce you to female leaders from every corner of the Commonwealth. And we might even use it to advocate to get the $357,000 that the governor used to fund uh, the, the commission through his budget back into the budget. So we're hopeful to do that as well. So thank you for helping to fund the commission. And we're going to keep still keep keep working on that. So um, from, from this, we're going to now kick it over to Dr. Stack, and he has some health updates for us. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm here today to talk to you about measles. Uh, measles was declared eliminated in the United States in the year 2000. At that point, the CDC had felt that we uh, no longer had any evidence of ongoing transmission in the country because vaccination rates had effectively eliminated the disease from the country. So for the last two and a half decades, roughly, none of us have had to worry about measles. And the only way to really get it was to travel to another country where measles was still spreading. Unfortunately, as the measles vaccination rate has decreased, this is one of those things where folks are opting out of vaccination more often, we're starting to see the increase of measles in the United States. So I'm gonna talk about the disease because most people in our country have never seen it, and even most physicians and nurses have never seen it, and it's something we all need to be more aware of. So for the first slide, if you are vaccinated, you almost certainly will get no symptoms from measles. In fact, the vaccine is so effective, you won't get sick at all, and you don't transmit the virus. If you are unvaccinated, and in the days before the vaccine was approved, which was in 1971, the symptoms were a cough, congestion, a fever, and not a low-grade fever like the common cold, like the really bad flu fever, 104 degrees and you feel miserable, and a rash, a rash that was all over your entire body, red blotchy uh, spots all over your body. In the unlucky ones, the complications are pneumonia, diarrhea, ear infections, and even sometimes brain swelling that can lead to things like seizures, developmental disabilities, and other permanent brain damage. In the unvaccinated population, pretty consistently, more than one in five are hospitalized. One in 20 develop pneumonia, which is the most common cause of death. The most common age of death is under five. Those are the individuals hurt the most by this disease if you're unvaccinated. And for the really unlucky, one in a thousand can get a permanent uh, brain injury from the brain swelling that I talked about. Now, thankfully, and on the next slide, please, measles is virtually entirely vaccine preventable. The vaccine was approved here in the United States in 1971. It's been in widespread use here and across the world. If you get two doses of vaccine, and they're most commonly recommended at about one year of age, and then a second dose between ages four and six, you are protected for life. If you're one of the unlucky 3% who is not fully protected, you almost certainly will have a much more mild disease and not be at risk for the most dangerous complications of the disease. Measles is really inconvenient and our experience that we've gone through with COVID is a very striking example we've all lived through. When the entire population is unprotected and disease can spread freely, you have big problems on a large scale. Measles is probably the most contagious viral disease on planet Earth at present. The only thing that could maybe compete with it is COVID. In this room, all of us in this press conference for a period of 40 to 60 minutes, if one person had measles in this room and we were unvaccinated, nine out of 10 of us would become infected with measles in about 10 to 12 days. The incubation period is long, 10 to 12 days. So you don't know you're gonna get it until you're well into this and you're contagious for four days before the rash and four days after the rash. So you don't know the people who are contagious for a good four days before they develop symptoms. Because of this, when someone is uh, developing measles or has measles, the recommendation in public health is that they should stay at home for 21 days and anyone exposed to them should stay at home for 21 days to avoid spreading the disease. That is horribly inconvenient, but one of the reasons we do it when we see it any time it occurs is so that the, all the rest of people in society don't have to live that experience. We know what that's like having gone through COVID just for um, the last few years. So folks, our vaccination rate is only about 90% for kindergartners for measles, mumps, rubella, and it has to be 95% or higher to spread or to stop transmission. And this is not an imaginary thing. There's at least 15 states who have already reported cases this year. We had to work with the Ohio Department uh, of Health uh, just this past month because someone traveled through Cincinnati Airport 
Last year, we had a large public gathering where we had an individual with measles. We intervened quickly and thankfully they were um, participatory in what we did. So we were able to contain the spread of that. But folks, this is becoming more common and because people travel a lot and are portable uh, in ways that weren't possible you know, in the prior century, um, it spreads too easily and can cause too many problems. So I just wanna urge and ask that everybody please go get yourselves and your children vaccinated if you are not already vaccinated. If you are vaccinated and you are exposed, you can continue your normal activities. You don't have to have any quarantine at home. You don't have to change your life whatsoever because the vaccine is just that effective for measles. It stops it dead in its tracks. And we wanna stop measles dead in its tracks before it stops other people in their tracks and prevents them from going on and living their lives. Uh, thank you very much and thank you, Governor. I agree with Dr. Stack on virtually everything, except for the fact that there is not a Cincinnati airport. There is only the Northern Kentucky slash Cincinnati airport. It's on our side of the river. Um, here in the Commonwealth, we have certainly had our share of weather events. So we know better than anyone how important it is to be aware and to be prepared when it comes to severe weather. That's why we recognize Severe Weather Awareness Week, which starts tomorrow, March 1st, and goes through March 6th. This week is an opportunity to empower Kentuckians to take proactive measures to protect themselves, their families, and their communities from the potential impacts of severe weather. I want to thank our partners the Kentucky, uh, at Kentucky Emergency Management and the National Weather Service that do a great job. Um, local emergency management agencies, first responders, and more for their dedication to keeping Kentuckians safe during severe weather events. Throughout the week, these folks will emphasize the importance of having a family emergency plan, creating an emergency supply kit, and staying informed about weather alerts and warnings. And remember, uh, you need a kit at home, you need a kit in the car if you're ever going to travel um, during one of those uh, potential uh, weather emergencies. I urge all Kentuckians to take the time to review their emergency plans. And if you don't have one, make one. One way you can help participate is by taking part in our annual tornado drill. So on March 6th at 10.07 Eastern or 9.07 Central, uh, that is when that annual drill occurs. You can contact your local emergency management or your local National Weather Service office for more information. Remember, we have been through the worst when it comes to severe weather, and we've lost far too many people. We've been really weather aware, certainly, since uh, those two events, and we've been through a lot since, but what we have seen is, is, is either no loss of life or really low loss of life. That is all because the people of Kentucky are, are listening to the meteorologists and the others that are out there. Let's keep it up. Let's not um, uh, grow tired. Let's make sure we we, we don't uh, forget uh, what we have been through. Let's continue to protect ourselves and to protect each other. And remember, as one of these events is coming up, don't assume your loved one or your friends have heard about it, even if it's all over the news. Make sure you call them and talk to them and make sure that each and every one of us are safe during these weather events. Okay, two uh, invitations coming up this next week. Next week, we have two events here at the Capitol. We wanna invite Kentuckians to join. First, on Tuesday, March 5th, we'll be marking the 60th anniversary of the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s March in Frankfurt. This was a historic event for civil rights that happened right here in Kentucky six decades ago. More than 10,000 people joined together to march here in our capital city for a day filled with music and speeches, all focused on freedom. We wanna invite you to join us on March 5th when we will commemorate this important day in history. At 9 a.m. Eastern time, Focus on Race Relations Frankfurt will kick things off at the Capitol City Museum. Then at 1045, we will start the march up Capitol Avenue. And at noon, we'll hear from inspiring speakers on the Capitol steps, including some individuals who attended the original march uh, 60 years ago. We hope to see you as we celebrate the strength of previous generations. And remember, this march was part of making an incredible difference. Jackie Robinson, Martin Luther King Jr., and ultimately it leading to the legislature passing and Ned Breathitt signing the first Civil Rights Act in the South. So please come out and mark this very important occasion where we can recommit 
to do in the hard work of building a better world. And then the next day, Wednesday, March 6th, we will mark the fourth anniversary of the COVID pandemic in the Commonwealth. We've been through so much together since that first day that Dr. Stack and I were right here. And we've come so far, but we will never forget the lives lost and the sacrifices that were made. So we wanna invite you to the Capitol on March 6th where we will commemorate this anniversary and we will recognize a day of compassion in the Commonwealth. Together, Kentucky has overcome so much with kindness and love, so we know together there's nothing that we can't overcome if we bring our compassion. The event will take place at the COVID Memorial on the Capitol grounds at 1 p.m. on March 6th. We're going to hear from inspiring speakers, and we will remember what we have overcome while also looking forward and thinking about how we can move forward together with that compassion. We think back on all those green lights which people put out to show other people that they cared about them, even when they couldn't look them in the eye. So part of how we're gonna commemorate COVID each year is to try to take that great lesson and remind each other about how important it can be as we move forward. And finally, this week's Team Kentucky All-Stars. So this week I was in Easter Kentucky to provide some great updates on rebuilding after the, the floods, especially in our high ground communities. It was a great day celebrating important progress. And I also had the honor of visiting Arley Boggs Elementary to celebrate the strength and resilience of the students, educators, healthcare heroes, and first responders following a scary bu bus crash last month. These students have been through so much and have been brave and strong. And I even got to spend some time with a special student, Gunner, who was the, the, the most severely injured and who is still uh, recovering. I learned that we're both little brothers. Our older brothers are about uh, the, the, the same amount of years older than us. And I looked at him and I said, we turn out all right. Uh, I got to applaud their strength and tell them we're all thankful that those kiddos are here with us. And thanks to the many healthcare heroes and first responders who showed up that day. I got them to meet them too and thank everyone at Letcher EMS, Neon Fire Department and uh, ARH Hospital, Comprehensive Health Whitesburg Medical Center, and so many more. We also celebrated our educators like Gary Sturgill, the bus driver, Principal Terry, and Superintendent Yance who are doing everything they can to support these students. For all their efforts, we're naming them this week's Team Kentucky All-Stars. Now, since we have a special guest with us today, Deputy Secretary Laura Daniel Davis, I'll first open it up to our journalists we have here. If you have a question on that program and that funding award, and then we'll move to our normal. Tom? Thank you, Governor. Uh, for the Secretary, I would like to know, how are the sites that will be getting this remediation, like how, how are they chosen and then what kind of priorities are uh, given on those? Well, that's a great question. And you know, these are federal resources, but the program is a partnership program with Kentucky's Abandoned Mine Land Division. And uh, it's up to uh, the state in that division to be doing the work on the ground. They get incoming from folks about areas that they believe need remediation in their communities and uh, they respond. And so the, the resources come through uh, the Department of the Interior and the Office of Surface Mining Reclamation and Enforcement, but the priority setting is really up to the state. Anybody else? All right. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, we'll move to McKenna. Um, thank you, Governor. There seems to be a trend of bills being filed in the legislature that would put a limit on executive branch powers. Um, so just say like Bill 8, which would allow partisan elections to go to the state school board, um, as well as House Bill 4, which would be a constitutional limit to allow bills in like public session sessions. Um, what do you make of these bills and what impact do you predict they will have on removing these checks and state government? Well, I believe uh, this last election in November showed that the people of Kentucky are fed up with rank partisanship about seeing the world in only a red or a blue lens. And that's what we're seeing in some of these bills where the supermajority is trying to strip uh, the governor of certain authority that governors have had going back in time, whether Democrat or Republican. And we can see from what happened when there was a change in the secretary of state that it's all about party. And they would likely switch it back the moment that a, a, a governor of a different party 
came in. That is not what we should be doing. People are exhausted about the, the back and forth. And, and think about it. I mean, they're focused on who has what powers instead of um, the jobs that people are going to or, or the quality of the roads or bridges that they're traveling over. We could spend this time talking about public safety, public education. Now it's time that, that they stop with the games and the partisanship and focus on what's most important uh, for, for the people. And listen, I'm, I'm reelected and term limited. You know, this is the time where we ought to be talking about the things we can do together. And if they're worried about somebody getting credit, I can't run again. So this is the time to get those things done and stop with this other stuff. You know, when we're elected, we're supposed to take off the partisan hat and do the, the, the will of the people. And, and it's time that we do it. Uh, Carolina. Yeah, <laughs> very similar. Um, the filling the U.S. Senate vacancy um, until last year uh, hadn't changed. Uh, the same authority that Paul Patton and Ernie Fletcher, uh, uh, Steve Bashir, and Matt Bevan had is the type of authority that they're trying to, to tear away from me and my time. Uh, as governor. Uh, and it appears they can't make up their mind because they changed it just a year ago and are trying to change it uh, yet uh, again. Uh, if we are just dominated by trying to create a result of what letter someone would have behind their name if appointed, then we are not uh, uh, performing or engaging in, in good government. Again, last November, people said, knock it off. We are tired of the rank partisanship, and we don't want a candidate or, or, or a general assembly that, that just sees Team R or Team D or, or, or red or blue. Uh, we want good government that focuses uh, on our people. And think about how much time they're going to spend debating it. How about we talk about expansion of, of health care and important needs that people have and not try to change this for the second time in two years? Uh, Austin. Thank you, Governor. Extended thoughts on Senator McConnell's legacy as leader, and then you've answered this question before. Uh, but are you still ruling out if there is an open Senate seat in 2026? Ruling out a run for that? Seat? I'm completely and totally ruling out a run for any open Senate seat in 2026. Uh, I love this job. We're seeing amazing things happen in the Commonwealth. Our economy is just exploding in special ways, and my kids are happy. All right, I'm going to keep doing this job every day, uh, every day uh, for this four year term that I was elected to. Uh, Senator McConnell announced that he is going to step down from leadership in November, uh, but serve out his term. Um, he has been in a position of leadership, whether in the minority or the majority, for a significant period of time. And that takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of time away from your family and your friends and others. So anyone who gives that type of service, we ought to recognize the sacrifice. Uh, and to say thank you. Uh, certainly appreciate his support on the bipartisan infrastructure law. And I think that that is going to be an incredible uh, uh, legacy moment of, of breaking through uh, partisanship and doing something that reverberates through uh, incredible projects for years to come. Now, the one thing that I hear though, that, that I wish I didn't is, is the impact on a political party. At the end of the day, if we've served this amount of time in government, I hope it's the benefits that we provided to our people that we've served, either the Commonwealth or our country that are at the top of any legacy we leave and, and, and not anything about partisanship. Uh, Tom, on this one. Oh, okay, uh, is Dr. Sacker on? He is here. Can I ask him a question, please? If you want to ask someone other than me a question, go right ahead. Okay, I'll be, I'll be uh, light on you today. Hey, thank you. Hello, Dr. Sacker. I have a question. You, you were talking about the measles vaccine didn't, didn't really take effect or wasn't really developed and, and opened up to what, 1971, I believe? That's when it was approved. Yeah. Um, as someone who had measles in the fourth grade, which was prior to 1971, uh, am I, should, should I be concerned about getting it again or you know, is it okay for old folks to get vaccinated? One, if you've had measles, you should be immune for life. So you don't need another vaccine. Two, if you have any doubt, if you have multiple medical problems or are concerned your immune system is weakened, the vaccine is totally safe and you can go get a booster shot if you want to. And your primary care physician could probably do that in their office. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
And I just want to, again, highlight that we need people to get this measles vaccine. I mean, 97% effective for life. You don't get better medicine uh, than that. Eradicating a disease that has caused so much harm. We, we really need people uh, to listen to, to this good advice. Okay, we have two journalists on virtually. First, Karen Czar. Good afternoon, Governor. Thank you so much. Um, do, have you had a chance, uh, yesterday, Senator Titchener filed Senate Bill 336, the Women's Bill of Rights, stating that there are only two sexes and seeking to ensure single-sex spaces for women. Uh, I don't know if you had a chance to look at it yet, but I'm curious on your thoughts on it. Thank you. I haven't looked at it yet, but how much time are we going to spend in a session on these types of things? And when people wake up every morning, they're not thinking about this. They're not thinking about what party they're in. They're not even thinking about who the next president's going to be. I mean, people come to Frankfurt and should be focused on where are people wake up in the morning? How's my job? And am I making uh, enough money to support my, my family? When's my next doctor's appointment? And can I afford it for myself, my kids, uh, my, my parents? Uh, do I feel safe in, in my community? Uh, how do I feel about the, the public education that my child is receiving? Uh, how am I going to go to work? And, and are the roads and, and the bridges safe? This is the work that the people of Kentucky want us to be doing each day. And remember, they have a limited amount of time under the Constitution to do the work in. And so oftentimes we look at certain bills that are filed and say, oh, my goodness. And, but, but what about what they're not doing because of them? Now, every moment that they focus on these culture war type issues, trying to create a new boogeyman for the next election, trying to rile people up, it means they're not doing important work that could benefit every single person. Again, I don't mean to keep talking about November, but I think it was very clear. People want someone focused on, on jobs and healthcare and moving their life forward, uh, not on all those things that, that pull us apart. Uh, next, Ariano uh, Sergio from WHAS. Hi, Governor. Um, so recently, Alabama Supreme Court ruled that frozen embryos could be considered children under state law. The ruling has raised concerns about IVF services in the state. What is your reaction to this decision, and would you support measures in Kentucky protecting IVF? The Alabama Supreme Court ruling is horrendous. It's terrible. And it's going to keep uh, families that are, are there in Alabama from welcoming uh, new children into this world. Listen, I'm of the generation where numerous of my friends have amazing children that have grown up with mine that I know so well that wouldn't be here without IVF. It is a gift from God that is helping people who want to be parents so badly uh, to, to, to welcome special children into this world. So anything that needs to be done to protect IVF or IVF access in Kentucky, I am 100% for. And this is what happens, though, when you embrace extremism uh, that goes as far as it's gone in Kentucky, where right now we have a law that makes different people concerned, and we're concerned on, on this as, as well. I mean, in Kentucky, we have a law where, where um, uh, women that have non-viable pregnancies still have to oftentimes carry um, that pregnancy to term, knowing they're going to hear their child die in moments afterwards, if it hasn't already happened. So when we hear about the IVF ruling, it thankfully brings out people's empathy. You know, whether you were pro this or pro that in a very different world that no longer exists, it brings out the empathy of saying, if these people really want to have a kid and science is going to help them do it, and they will be such great parents, why would we ever stand in the way of that? I hope we can bring that same empathy here in Kentucky with some bills we have coming through, like allowing exceptions under our current law for rape and incest. I mean, those individuals that have been violated, that have been violated oftentimes by a member of their own family, too young to protect themselves or unable to, to protect themselves. I mean, they deserve options. This level of extremism, people of Kentucky do not like, and we need to, to do better and to be better. And what happened in Alabama shows what happens when, when extremism is embraced. But let me go back to the original question. IVF is so critical. 
Uh, we have so many wonderful people in our world, children of God, because um, uh, of, of those scientific advancements. So I would support anything that we would need to further protect that access in Kentucky. Okay, uh, we got done about 10 minutes early. Uh, thank you all. We'll see you at the next Team Kentucky update. I'm good. Oh, you sure? Uh, you know, I've got Team Kentucky update. We have got a lot of good news today, and we'll start restoring historic mine lands and providing safe and reliable drinking water to our restoring a hillside after a landslide threatened a home and blocked out eastern Kentucky families. Last June, we announced that Kentucky was being awarded more than six left by historic mining. These funds are helping us close dangerous mine shafts. Just some of the projects include the NASCAR Lane Project in Perry County. Uh,